On the phone is Viktor Ostrovsky. He's an ex-Mossad case officer, former member of the Israeli Defense Force, lieutenant commander of the Israeli Navy, and has plenty of counterterrorism and military experience. Also the founder of thebookpatch.com. Thank you for being with us, sir. Oh, thank you for having me. So uh, there's so much to talk about with you, and I'm, I'm not sure where to start. Number one, can we, whatever you can tell us about your experience as a Mossad case officer, I would love to hear kind of what it's like day to day. Well, um, basically it's a lot of hurry up and wait. It's, it's where you wait that's the problem. Hmm. Uh, it's, the, a case officer is, you know, uh, is a combination of, of a, uh, a soldier and an uh, information gatherer. In fact, what you do, is, especially in an agency like Mossad, which is you don't have, uh, at the time, you don't have embassies in enemy countries. You see, like the CIA, when it was working against the Soviet Union, had an embassy in Moscow mm. and, and other places. We have access. Um, we did not have access. So we had to recruit uh, our agents in foreign countries, which means if I needed to recruit a Syrian uh, colonel or something of that rank or higher from the Syrian Air Force to right. gather information about them, I had to do that in London. And what we're talking about is, is a double agent, essentially, right? We're, we're, well, no, a double agent, is, there's a lot of terminology that, that you know gets mixed up. First of all, an agent is a person that you recruit off the enemy and you send him back to his country to gather information for you. Under the, guise, under the guise of being working for someone else. Well, yeah. He, he, uh, he, get an example. Uh, let's say um, an Iraqi uh, scientist who works for, worked at the time for the Iraqi nuclear program. Uh, he, he was training in uh, Cicle in France when, where they bought their facility. Uh, recruiting uh, a Mossad case officer would then make an approach through a, it's an operation it doesn't happen overnight it takes time and setting up you approach him and you get him to work for you so he gathers information for Israel while he's still working as an Iraqi scientist um, and uh, that's an agent a double agent is when I recruited him to work for me He's an Iraqi, and I recruited him to work for Israel, and the Iraqis find out about it, and they turn him back. Right. So now you have a guy who's a double agent who is really um, feeding you false information. You know, every, every once in a while we hear about a double agent that's been discovered and jailed or a spy that's been uncovered. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the spy novel. George Smiley, to me, is a household name. I don't know if you've read any of those. Absolutely. Uh, so every is, one of them. Is the reality that, uh, of being involved in espionage more like James Bond or more like George Smiley, where it can be very boring, like you said, a lot of, a lot of waiting around and a lot of loneliness, right? Absolutely. There is nobody like La Carre to describe the actual work in the field. Hmm. Uh, today, as the, as the blocks collapsed, so to speak, and now you're talking more on a lower level, which means you're recruiting terrorists, right. uh, then it's kind of a combination between Smiley and uh, born identity. Sure. <laughs> so it's somewhere in the middle. It by no means is a James Bond. I mean, he would not last a day in the real. I mean, here's a guy who approaches somebody, and the first thing he says, he gives him his real name. I mean, right. Bond, James Bond. And uh, is there in the real world of espionage, it's not as easy to get women as it is for James Bond, right? Well, the women that are used now, I'm talking specifically to the Mossad, which sure. is Israel's intelligence service. Yeah. It was difficult to have women as case officers because hmm. we were recruiting from the Arab world. Well, I and, mean more that James Bond is a ladies' man, and uh, that's not the reality for the majority of, of agents. Uh, no, no, this gotcha. is you know this is the, some kind of um, uh, a nice fantasy uh, <laughs> to, to put it up there. Uh, it, it, look, you, don't forget, you are. Uh, a government employee yeah. uh, that are, is sent on uh, you know very uh, dangerous missions, and and that's what you do. But you're not, um, uh, you know, the, the, there is no reason for you to be this ladies' man because right. you're not. You know, you can't go around saying I'm Bond. Right. 
Hey, um, my father was recently in Israel, and he described in detail the procedures used at the Tel Aviv airport. And uh, overall, and you tell me if he's wrong or if I'm wrong in my understanding, the big difference with security there versus in the U.S. is that in the U.S., TSA agents rarely look you in the eye, and they're focused on your luggage, whereas in Israel, the focus seems to be on the person instead of on their luggage. Is that a r correct assessment? It's on both. You, you have to understand that in Israel, the, the, you know, the, the amount of traffic you're talking about is very minimal hmm. r relative to everything else. You have one major airline and one major airport, uh, which is as a major as it is, it's not as big as Newark. Uh, so this is, it's easier to, to do that. You have a, a larger procedure. For example, uh, a lot of times, if you want to save yourself time, you will provide, and some are requested to provide your luggage a day ahead. So you can drop your luggage off, and it goes through pressurized rooms where you know it, it, it uh, imitates the, uh, the altitude of an airplane going up and down, etc. Hmm. Uh, so the luggage is secured. Uh, you have more time. You're requested to show up four hours before the flight. Right. Uh, th this is not something, and, and for example, when you have El Al stations uh, in other countries, they're separated in an airport in a small area, and they're guarded by people that are uh, from the Israeli security services. Uh, so it, it's a whole system that is way different than what the U.S. is, and it's more... It's more targeted, too. Don't forget, the, the Israelis are far more targeted as, as a terrorist target, until now, it was anyway, sure. than, than the U.S. is. You, you cannot compare the two. The, the major thing, too, is the, uh, the American system relies very much on, on contractors. Right. The Israeli system does not. Uh, these are government employees, and they're very highly regarded. Uh, they're from they're from the internal security. Uh, they get training in weaponry. Uh, they get training in in equipment, uh, interrogation, uh, and they are not afraid to do what's called profiling. And, Although, it's a, and when you say profiling, it's not racial profiling, but it's, it's behavior profiling. Absolutely, you know, race. Uh, you know. Racial or age, I hear a lot when people are saying lately, oh, you know, they check this little old lady when she, before she, well, a little old lady can explode. Sure. So uh, saying, like, we in Israel, there was an expectation of a terrorist attack from Palestinians at the time, and and the Palestinians were smart enough to recruit the uh, the Red Army Brigades, which were Japanese, and a group of Japanese terrorist arrived in Lud or Lod Airport, which is the Ben-Gurion Airport now, and they carried out a massacre there because they were not expected. You know, they weren't profiled Right, absolutely. Properly. So behavior seems to be a much more effective way to go than any age, race, or, uh, or any or country of origin. Yes. The other thing is, I, I think you're, people are underestimating the, the TSA. Um, and and it, it's a good thing. Well, when you hear about a guy is on the phone, so he lets somebody go the wrong way through New York Airport security, it doesn't sound good, right? It, well, it happens in Israel, too. Yeah. People have gone on airplanes in Israel with weapons, hmm. uh, you know, and tried the system and made it, you know, and, and had gone through it. And there's always a failure somewhere. But when you're comparing the size, look, take the example of this flight, uh, you know, the Northwest flight. To the underwear Israel. bomber. Yeah, he's an excellent example of the of the quality of the TSA. I mean, the terrorists, if they wanted to, I mean, if they had their druthers and their choice, they would have taken an airplane or boarded a plane in the U.S. Uh, it's still full of fuel. Uh, it's closer to the target, which means if you want to blow it over a city, you're taking off from a city. Hmm. Uh, on the other hand, they chose to go to Sheepol Airport, which is way out there, take a plane that made had to cross the Atlantic before they made their attempt to blow it up. Right. Now, if you're comparing Israelis and others, well, the Sheephole Airport is really uh, the people who are handling the security there or are training the security there, at least, is a company called ICTS, which is an Israeli company. Hmm. So you have, it, it kind of puts everything you know on its head, and the same company has a subdivision that is handling about 30 airports in the U.S.
With regard to the whole body screening that is being talked about implementing in the U.S., everything I've read suggests it would be implemented at some airports. So my question is, is, is that going to be effective? Wouldn't terrorists just figure out which one those are and fly to other airports? Yes. So, yeah, probably. So probably. what you're saying is unless you put it in every single airport, it's not going to have any effect. No, I, have it has, I think it has an effect in the fact that you're showing that you're making efforts in, in, in the technological way. Uh, I think, though, that basic screening uh, of, of, of data uh, would be sufficient. I mean, we're going overboard in technology. We're expecting uh, the, the me mechanisms and the technology to solve our problem. Uh, it, it's the same thing, by the way, in the spy world. Um, the the CIA relied very highly on on electronics and and devices, and very little on human, uh, which is you know the the recruiting of of somebody, and and you cannot rely on information more than from a person's mouth. I mean. He was there when somebody said something, and he brought you the information. Right. Uh, it's it's more expensive to get. It's harder. Sure. Uh, but that's the kind of information you need. Uh, my last question for you, and I wish we had more time to talk, is red flags and the underwear bomber. I have a long list here that come up to me, which is he paid cash for a one-way ticket. He brought no luggage to travel halfway around the world. He had no passport. He claimed to be from Sudan when he was Nigerian, and his own father had called the CIA about him. Now, is this the result of no talking between agencies that he was able to go from country to country, or is the problem somewhere else? I mean, with so many red flags. Absolutely somewhere else, and I'll tell you where. Uh, the airport security in Sheephole should have gone on to this. Hmm. Uh, the the ticket, and not only that, he was too. Based on his age, his ex ticket was far more expensive than he should have been. Uh, you know, and and all those red flags should have been raised by the security elements in the airport. So it was there was a failure in in a lot of locations. And not, yeah, not, I mean, in his origin, he was allowed to get on under the guise of being from a different country with no passport. That's a problem. That's a problem. You have problems every step of the way. The fact that he was on a list shouldn't raise us a lot of flags because that means that we're only protecting against people who are on a list. So if sure, they're not well, on a list... And Ted Kennedy was on that list for a while. So yeah, there you go. We so, know the list isn't the end of the world, right? No, and he shouldn't be relying just on that. It, it's, a, it's a tool. It's one more tool in the, in the system. But I think the size of the U.S. and the size of the, air, you know, of the whole system is its best protection. Um, because, you know, we're, we're talking... We're, we're very scared, and we're quite panicky about it, but in the big picture, it, it's not that bad. Victor Ostrovsky is an ex-Mossad case officer, former member of the Israeli Defense Force, and founder and CEO of thebookpatch.com. Thanks so much for calling in today. Thank you for, for having me. Okay, take care. Fascinating, fascinating stuff, Lewis. I mean, really hands-on knowledge yeah. of exactly where things broke down, and uh, I mean, just the, the work, the, the stories he could tell if he if they weren't secrets, I'm sure it would, would fill pages and pages of books. I can't imagine. Reminds me a little bit, uh, just the airport talk, you know, about my, uh, my trip to Israel. Right. And how long I was questioned. Right. Well, Lewis has this situation where he, uh, he's, he is Jewish and he was on a birthright trip, but his father is from Iran. And the tattoos probably didn't help, right? I mean, we know from... Uh, I don't believe I had any at the time. Okay. And you, it, there were a lot of questions asked. Yes, I, w I was questioned for about twice as long as, as anybody else. Uh, what kind of questions? More. Well, basic questions, but then uh, the questions were repeated to make sure I was telling the truth. Questions about if you had a bar mitzvah? No, where I was from, you know. Which uh, one of your parents is Jewish? Which I no, think no, is well, where I was coming from, uh, you know, which airport I, I flew in from, uh, you know, stuff like that. And it went on for 15, 20 minutes? Uh, I would say maybe uh, five to ten minutes, but all the other interviews were very short for like the rest of the people on the trip. A couple of minutes. One to two minutes. Hmm.